it was just, but anyway, so I'm going to try not to do that this morning. But I will tell you a few things, and, and again, I'm normally very open about this. But uh, basically, I am the poster child for mental illness. And um, I, I say that a lot, and y'all laugh a lot about that, but that's really true. Uh, you just don't know how true that is. But um, um, I was raised in an Assembly of God home. I was raised where we never missed services. We were taught to believe the Bible. We paid our tithes. We read our Bibles. We prayed. We studied the Word. We believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And yet, in spite of that, that did not stop me from being abused as a child, starting at the age of three. Now, I clean up pretty good sometimes, unless you come to my house and people think I'm really sick. They're like, are you sick? I'm like, no, I just... This is the way I look at all, nothing, no makeup on anything. Oh, clothes, oh, clothes, but, you know, anyway. Anyway, starting at the age of three, I, I suffered um, what doctors have called horrific, and I normally don't get nervous, I'm just shaking. <laughs> if y'all hear anything knocking, it's my knees. Um, but um, I suffered uh, emotional, physical, verbal, sexual, ritualistic and religious abuse and mental oh that's emotional is that emotional oh well and mental abuse let's add another one God had a call early on in my life and I knew it but that didn't keep me out of trouble there's not very much I have not seen I have not done or I have not witnessed or participated in in my life now, I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you that to let you know where God's brought me from. I don't remember much about our last seminar that we had. And the reason for that is because the devil was fighting me full force. But a seed had already been planted by Dr. Malone. My niece had told me about the Freedom and Fullness Seminar. And she had told me about... I don't ever do this. My hand is shaking. <laughs> um, it's, all that healing. it's all that healing. It is. But I don't remember much about what was uh, about the seminar because, I, like I said, the devil was really fighting me. But Dr. Malone did schedule a, a special uh, private ministry time for me at his home, uh, his home office in Texas, outside of Dallas, Texas. And so uh, Pastor Rick, myself, and Mike Miller uh, rode, uh, drove, or I rode, but he drove, somebody drove, um, and for I uh, ended up to be a four-hour meeting. Now, there was no head spinning and green vomit or, you know, some of those things that we like to hear about. But I want to tell you, God did a work in my heart, and it started with the healing and, full, I mean, the fullness and freedom seminar. Because of the things that happened in my life, at a very early age, after, I didn't know he was going to be in here, but um, that's all right. But after um, some of the ritualistic, and it was not satanic, but it was ritualistic none the, nonetheless, some of the ritualistic abuse and stuff that was uh, done to me, I thought it would be a good idea. It would help lessen what they did to me if I did it myself. And so even back before the term became popular or anything, I self began to self-mutilate at the age of seven to nine. Nobody told me about it, didn't have to know. The devil knew, and he planted that seed in me. Now then, it's a hip thing to do. Uh, crazy, but it, you know, it's very popular now for self-mutilation. I did it back before it was popular. <laughs> I didn't know it was popular. But that was something that I did to deal with all of the trauma that happened in my life. But God had a plan, and that plan was for me to be set free and delivered. And I tell you, I have met and been prayed for by some top people in this country. Have I not? I mean, I could call their names big names. And God did things, and he ministered to me. But I want to tell you that I only got so far. And I'm going to tell you a couple of things that were said over me, little word curses, but I'm going to tell you some things that were said about me that you could go to and look right now in my medical file 
and you will see them. Doctors told me, not just one, but almost, almost exclusively all of my doctors, except for maybe one or two, told me that I would self-mutilate until I died. I would die by my own hand, and I would probably follow the path of some 12-plus friends I had that, that committed suicide or died from overdose. And with all of my psychiatric diagnoses, which are long, they said there is no hope. Doctors told my husband and my children, uh, Ashley especially, she needs to be committed to Bryce and never get out. That's where we plan on putting her. We're going to put her in Bryce. She's not going to get out. So when I say that I was the poster child for mental illness, I'm really serious about it, even though I'm, I'm teasing at some point. But, but God opened the door through that seminar. And I want you to know that, when did we have that meeting? It was October 2012. But I want to tell you what God did for me, what Satan meant for evil, from that seminar and then continuing on the, the ministry that happened with Dr. Malone of October last year, it has been one year and five months, and there has been no self-mutilation whatsoever. Now then, God gets all the glory. I, I'm telling you, God gets all the glory. I've, I've been on alcohol. I've been on drugs. I've been, I mean, I've done all of that stuff. But... And you can not go where alcohol is. You can not go where drugs are. You can't get away from your body. It's there. I mean, I come over here and here it is. Come over here and there it is. I mean, you can't get away from it. And the devil knew that. And I was like in this grip. And any, any time I got upset, something bad happened, I could self-mutilate. And I would calm. I know it doesn't make sense. I would calm completely down. And I'm talking about, I'm not talking about like a paper cut or whatever. I'm talking sulfuric acid which melts uh, everything but glass on my body and you know and that's what all the scars are from from surgeries and skin grafts and all that stuff but I want you to know none of that have had none of that for one year and five months because God had a plan not only would I not be alive is that not true is that not true not only would I not be alive I wouldn't be your pastor's wife. And I count it such an honor to be your pastor's wife. I told the board before we, um, I, 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 they asked us about being the pastor, I said, no, y'all know all the bad, terrible things. Jack and Cheryl and Randy and Pat and Sylvia and Mike and some of these others, they have seen me at my worst. I mean, there was no looking up to see the bottom. It was too far. I mean, it was bad, really bad. And I'll never forget, they were so encouraging and loving. But Jack Willenbrock, I don't know where he is, but Jack Willenbrock said to me, it doesn't matter. We know all of that. We've seen where you've been, and we still love you. And the thing I want to tell you is that no matter what it is, that you may have been through in your life, no matter how long you might have kept it hidden, no matter how well it looked on the outside. My family was the pillar. They were pillars in the community. I mean, we weren't like, you know, we, we just know how to, I think sometimes it's, it's worse because we, we know how to hide everything. We know how to act the part and do the part and, you know, do all these things in the church. And at the same time, the devil is wrecking havoc in our lives. But God wants us to have freedom, complete freedom and fullness. And we can do that through his word. And part of that is a step towards that is this seminar. And um, I just wanted to share. I hope I didn't share too much. hope I didn't freak you out or anything. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, um, and I didn't want to embarrass my, I, I embarrass them all the time. But uh, I didn't want to embarrass them too much or whatever. But I just wanted you to know God is faithful. And he who hath begun a work in me will do, it, to do the same thing in you. 
As Brother uh, Jim said Wednesday night, God does no respecter of persons. If he knows the number of hairs on everybody's head, and if he knows when a sparrow falls, he's concerned about you and what you're going through. And he wants you to walk in freedom, complete freedom, and walk in the power and unction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on. You know, you don't know how just to see her be able to do that is incredible. Because we went from Cleveland, Ohio, to Naples, Florida, to Oklahoma City. to Warrior, Alabama, Huntsville. We traveled all over this country with money we didn't have. I don't even know how we did it. Because we couldn't pastor at that time. I had a Bible college degree, and do you know what a Bible college de degree will get you in the business world? Nothing. 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 So it was this job, this job, this job. And finally in Dallas, Texas. I'm not here to, to sing the praises of Dr. Henry Malone, Henry Malone, but he knew what he was doing. He had researched and he knew there was hope. Others would throw their hands up. And this man will be here next Sunday, and I hold him in high regard because of the investment that he put in my family. And that investment is paying off for this church. Okay? It really is. So I give God praise for all of that. I hope y'all aren't in a hurry because we still got some things to do, but I need our ushers to come. We're going to receive an offering. To go to this seminar at $75 a person, that the church gets not one red penny of that. It strictly goes to cover their costs. There are, there's a team of 10 people that are traveling here, and they're coming from Ohio, Iowa, the northern states, the southern states. They're paying their own way. They're staying at the Hampton Inn in Fultondale. Our church is covering the cost of the flight for Dr. Malone and his assistant and paying for their hotel room for two nights and feeding them. But that is a small thing for what it can do for you. This offering is not even going to help the church with our part. This is to help give money, scholarships for people to attend this seminar. We got people who want to come and $75 to some people, a lot of us, is hard to come by. So if you could pay 75 or even for two, $150, it would be awesome. And this will be divided up among these people to help them, okay? Be able to come to this seminar to receive the help that they need. And if you say, I would love to go that, Brother Rick, but I can't afford it, come to this meeting after the church, okay? Don't let money stand in your way. Amen. Guys. Thank you for your giving. I want you to stand with me, if you would, please, and take your Bible. And hold it up like this right here. I am going to speak briefly, hopefully, because if I don't get this uh, series on Revelation finished this morning, it'll be June before I get to <laughs> So we're going to try to finish up on number seven. Let's all say this together. This is my Bible, God's holy word. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. I can speak with new tongues. I heal the sick. I cast out demons, all in the name of Jesus. The Bible is my legal document, sealed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. And Thomas, uh, uh, Paul read that scripture, so we're going to let that suffice today because we do want to have communion as well, and that's why I want to get right into this. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. 
the church at Laodicea. When you get there, say amen. <laughs> Brother Jim, it's catching on. <laughs> and the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these thing, things, says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning, the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were hot or cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten therefore be zealous and repent. Behold I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you now for the power of your word and for the moving of the Holy Spirit in your presence here this morning. And I just ask right now, Lord, that you will help us as we minister your word today to preach under the anointing and inspiration of the Holy Spirit and say those things, Lord, that you would want us to say and refrain from the things that you don't want us to say. And I thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here. It is so great to see you and your family. Uh, Rosetta family, great to have you guys here today as well. The church at Laodicea, Jesus had nothing good to say. Think about that. Now, we are adherents here, or, or we, we, we want to uh, always look for something good in everybody. Have you ever heard that? There's bound to be something good in every person. Well, you would think there would be something good <laughs> that Jesus could have found in the church at Laodicea. But if he did, he didn't feel the need at this point to talk about it. Because there was something that was more important that that church needed to hear. As you, as you know, I have, I have uh, said this throughout this entire sermon series of seven messages that I believe each one of these letters were specific letters to specific churches in that day and time. And that the situations in those churches also are relevant to the situations of churches today. So I want to clear that up. The city of Laodicea was actually a, not a real ancient city in that day and time. It was a fairly new city that had been built on a particular uh, place uh, that had, uh, it was about 100 miles from, uh, from uh, Sardis, about 43 miles from Philadelphia that we talked about last week, set down in the southern part of the country. And we find that there were three main roads that came to uh, the city of Laodicea. One came from Philadelphia, one from Sardis, and one, I think, from uh, uh, Phrygia uh, on the other side. And so it was a great commercial city, and it was a very wealthy city. It had lots of wealth, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And, and as I mentioned, you know, Jesus is so real to these people, and he used their situation in order to uh, get them to the place that they needed to be and make them understand what he was saying to them. He used their situation. He used their economy. He used their livelihood. He used, he used their possessions, their materialism. He used all of this to point out what they needed. Whatever business you are in, wherever you work, whatever you do, God will take what you do and what you know to do and help you refine how you need to live. God will, will use your situation just like he did with the woman at the well. When, he went, when Jesus went there to speak to her, he spoke to her on, her on her level. He didn't give her some new thing, but he spoke to her on her level and, and speaking to her of things that she knew about. And so Jesus will do that much, in, in, and we need to do that in evangelism. And so we find that Laodicea was very wealthy. It was, had a famous medical school in Laodicea. And in this medical school, they were famous for healing of the eyes. There was a particular uh, uh, fluid that was found in some fish in that area. And they would extract that fluid and they would use it as eye salve. And people would come from all over and come to Laodicea for healing of their eyes. 
Now there was also that was something unique to that area. They were very rich in ways in raising a very unique type of sheep. These sheep had black wool, not the white wool, but black wool, and it was very silky, and it was something that every all the rich people wanted. And they would pay lots of money for that black wool from those sheep. And it was unique to Laodicea, and they farmed that, and they raised those sheep, and so they were, they were very wealthy in the clothing industry. Uh, their rags looked pretty good. And they were very proud of their rags, and you could see all those people walking into the church of Laodicea, or as it would be popular, the church at Laodicea. <laughs> And they would be wearing their wealthy clothes. They would have on the best that money could buy because they could afford it. And that's what they had. So they had that. Then they also had some hot springs in that area that was uh, uh, considered healing, much like the springs at Hot Springs, Arkansas. And you've heard of those. And so people would come and find these mineral springs. And the water in these mineral springs was uh, tepid. Lukewarm. You see how Jesus just takes their situation and uses what they know to rebuke them? <laughs> He'll take what you know to rebuke you. So these mineral, uh, as a matter of fact, this tepid water would get so, uh, would make you so nauseated that many people would throw up when they would be dipped into this water. Well, I'll be. Jesus wasn't sharing anything new with them. They knew exactly what he was talking about when he said, I would that you were hot or cold. But because you are what? Lukewarm, I'll vomit. He knew exactly. They knew exactly what he meant. There was no question in their mind. Can you see the relevance of that letter? Jesus is pretty smart, isn't he? <laughs> he's just pretty sharp and so just keep that in mind as we look at this this morning because those are some important characteristics of, this, of, of uh, Laodicea also we find that Jews were highly accepted in Laodicea now many of the cities the Jews were looked down upon but in Laodicea they welcomed, welcomed them because what are Jews in the, in the commercial world famous for? Money. Jews, rich Jews, would bring their money to, to Laodicea. And the Laodiceans welcomed them. Okay? So they weren't despised like they were other places. And so you had this mixture of people that came into Laodicea. It might have been called the melting pot. Oh, that's the United States, isn't it? We find that the real problem here was lukewarmness. And we find that Jesus, the true witness, the faithful and true witness, means genuine. I, I talked about that last week. True meaning genuine. The genuine witness. He knows what he's talking about. He, he wanted to speak to them and, and he was going to tell them the truth. I read this the other day. It said, if religion is real then it is the most excellent thing, therefore we should be earnest in it. Now, in that context, religion is what I'm, I would refer to as a relationship with Jesus Christ. But the problem at Laodicea that led to lukewarmness was religion. Religion. Religious spirits. We find that in Laodicea, the cause of the lukewarmness was this religious spirit that said, we have need of nothing. The reason they felt they had need of nothing was because of their material wealth and because of their sheep, the things that they raised, and because of their medical school. They didn't need any help. As a matter of fact, there was an earthquake that devastated that entire region and the Roman government sent money to rebuild those cities. And Laodicea accepted that money. Several years later, another earthquake came and devastated the city again. But this time, and Jesus knew about this, 
Rome again, Rome again was going to send money to help. And they said, we don't need your help. We got this. We don't need anything. We don't need any help from Rome because we can take care of it ourselves. You say, well, that sounds like a good thing. But it's the attitude behind it. Did you know there are people sitting here this morning in this church that says, I don't need your help. I don't need the help of this church. I don't need it. I don't need anything you got. You say, how do you know that? Well, in a crowd this size, there's bound to be one. And it might be more than one. I don't need any. Have you ever run into anybody that said, I don't need anything that God's got to offer. I got this. I've met them. I don't need anything God's got to offer because I've got this. And they've got all the things they need. They've got their material wealth. They've got position. They've got their health. They've got all this stuff. But the day will come when they will say, I wish I hadn't have said that because I need God. And that's the place that the Laodiceans were in. Their lukewarmness was caused by this religious spirit of I don't need anything. They worshipped God in their worship services. They had a church, but I doubt it was much of a church like our church. I doubt it was much like the church at Philadelphia. I doubt that it was much like the church at Ephesus. Now, it started out that way. But it had digressed into a place of conceitfulness. What brings lukewarmness to Christians is they get conceited. They get to the place where I don't need any, I don't need to go to a Sunday night prayer meeting. I can pray at home. I don't need to go to Wednesday night Bible study because I've got this to do and that to do and I don't like this about it or that about it. I don't need anything they've got. I'll go to my one service Sunday morning and that's all I need. Oh boy, did I just hit some. I don't need what they've got. I know more than the person that's teaching. And I'll move on. An unteachable spirit, an unteachable spirit is a religious spirit. Brother, sister, if you think you've got it all under control, have at it. Just take off with it. See where it gets you. The seven sons of Sceva thought they had it all under control too, didn't they, Brother Lee? Buddy, they thought, man, we got this. We watched them cast them devils out. We're going to go try this on our own. Nobody could teach them anything, could they? Because they knew it all. They had seen it. They knew it existed, and we're going to go do it. We're going to cast the devil out of this man. While that devil whipped them every which way but loose, and they run away naked. I'm glad I wasn't there. (laughs) How about you? (laughs) You see, when you think you know everything, you think you know everything. Well... I don't like the way they do that at church. I could do it this way. Well, you probably could. You probably could. But you see, you've got to have a teachable spirit. You couldn't teach the Laodiceans anything because they knew it all. They had it all. This is what Jesus was saying to them. You think you got all this eyesight? You got that medical school, but you're blind. You got all this material wealth and clothing industry, but you're naked. You got everything. You got these sheep out here. But you hadn't got anything. You're poor. How could Jesus look at the Laodiceans, who was the wealthiest city in that area, and tell them they had nothing, that they was poor? How could he look at the place where people was coming to receive sight, healing for their eyes, and he told them they was blind? Now, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Either Jesus was lying or they was. They was. was. (laughs) Thank you, Thomas. (laughs) They was, wasn't they, Thomas? They was fooled. They had a religious spirit and said, we have need of nothing. We have need of nothing. Well, can I tell you right here this morning, you're coming to a church that doesn't say we have need of nothing. We're wanting to build a brand new church and we need help. 
I'll be, I'll stand right out here and tell you, we need you. We need you doing your thing. We need you doing what God's called you to do. We, now we have everything when it comes to Jesus Christ because he is our supplier. He is our source. And he's the one that we look to and the one that we turn to. And I tell you this morning, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, we battled religious spirits when we first moved in here and we drove every one of them out of this place. So don't you dare bring one back in here. <laughs> you check him at the door. <laughs> he ain't welcome. You are, but that religious spirit isn't. You say, what are you talking about a religious spirit? Well, I'm going to give you one example. My home church used to be full of them. I'm not there now, and I pray that it changed, and I believe it has because the church is growing by leaps and bounds. And I'm going there June the 8th to preach homecoming. So <laughs> if, if I'll, I'll tell them about it if I'm there. Because <laughs> they may never invite me back. But no, here was a religious spirit in my home church. Okay? This was the religious spirit. Somebody could come to the altar and get saved. And somebody in leadership, knowing that person, let's say, for instance, they smoked. they would follow them right out the door to see if they lit up a cigarette when they got outside. That's a religious spirit. That's a religious spirit. My, my daddy, he died when he was 61 years old in 1987 of a heart attack. But I tried to get him to go to church and, and he... Now, our, our youth group was an on-fire youth group. We had a great youth ministry. And our pastor wasn't the way the religious spirit was. Let me tell you that. That's why they turn to change pastors about every five years, you know. But uh, Brother Randall was an awesome person and pastor. And my daddy, he, he called me one day. We were pastoring the mobile. He called me up. He said, he said, Rick, I just wanted to tell you I got saved this morning. I said, how awesome. He called me and told me, and we were excited. And so we went back home, and, and he wasn't going to church. And I said, I was talking to him. We went and had coffee. He had coffee. I had a Coke. And I said, why? Why are you not going to church? He said, well, because I smoke. I said, okay. He said, well, you know, I've always been taught that if you smoke, you can't go to heaven. And I've tried to quit and tried to quit, and I just can't quit. And uh, I said, well, you know what, Dad? Just go anyway. I said, I believe you'll go to heaven. Now, you might smell like you've been in hell, but you'll... you'll. <laughs> but I believe you can go to heaven. And he laughed and everything. Well, he, he decided he'd go. A Bible college-educated young man was teaching the adult Sunday school class. And in that Sunday school class, he said, knowing my dad was there, Knowing that I had talked to him, knowing the situation, he says in Sunday school, you can't go to heaven if you smoke. Religious spirit. You've preached in places, haven't you, brother? My dad didn't go back. And so the night I was pastoring in Greenwood, Arkansas, the night that my dad passed away, my brother called me. That night is, is on a Wednesday night after church. It's about 10 after 11, and my phone rang. And any time it rings that time of night, so it's wrong, you know. And uh, I saw it was from Truman. And my brother, when I answered, I said, hello. And he said, Rick. And he said, and he handed the phone off to my other brother. I thought something's wrong. And he said, and my other brother got on. He said, I need to tell you. He said, Daddy died a while ago. The first words out of my mouth was, did anybody pray with him? That was the first thing I asked. And I struggled so much. And of course, we got up, got the kids, Ashley and Amy. They were small. We went to Truman, had the funeral and all this stuff. And me and one of my brothers was sitting at the table, and he was crying. And he said, do you think Daddy went to hell? And I said, no, I don't think he did. I said, because I prayed, and I knew the struggle that he'd had. And none of the other family knew this struggle. And I said, God gave me this. And this was the only answer God gave me when I said, 
Lord, I need to know. And this is what God said, and this was his way of telling me that everything's okay. He said, your daddy knew how to pray. So you know what that answered to me? That my daddy prayed. Because when he was on the, when he was doing the heart, he died during a heart cath. And he told them, when they hit the blockage, he told them, he said, I'm having a heart attack, I can't hardly breathe. And so he had a few seconds Maybe even a minute. He knew what was happening. He knew what was going on. And by the time they got him transferred from one uh, gurney to another, he was gone. Just that quick. Just that quick. But a religious spirit, a religious spirit from a lukewarm, I don't even think you can call them They've been called lukewarm Christians. I think that's an oxymoron. I think it's, it's a contradiction of terms. I don't think you can be lukewarm and be a Christian. So I would just say a lukewarm religious person. Almost cost a man his soul because of religious spirits thinking they knew everything and that they had all the answers. That's why when you become a member of Restoration Christian Fellowship, we don't have a membership card that has a list of do's and don'ts on it. It just simply says, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior? Because we don't want that religious spirit here. It won't be here in the name of Jesus because it drives people away. It kills people's souls. And it leads to lukewarmness. The word hot that Jesus used, it doesn't mean just hot to the touch. When he says, I would that you were hot or cold, hot means to the boiling point. To the boiling point. Now how many of you this morning are, on, are so on fire for Jesus that you're to the boiling point. Because that's what Jesus meant. That people call it fanaticism, don't they, Randy? Well, that's all right. I remember the Hensons back in the 1980s, and that's way back for some of you folks. But I remember Ronnie Henson saying one time they were singing and and he got on there and he said, you can call me a fanatic all you want to as long as you know who I'm fanatic about. As long as you know who I'm fanatic about. I'm fanatic about Jesus. I'm fanatic about the Holy Spirit. I'm fanatic about the gifts of the Spirit. I'm fanatic about all that God is and all that God wants to be. That's what I want to be. I want to be to the boiling point. I don't want to simmer. I don't want to just sit on the stove and get warm. I don't want to just be warmed up last year's warmed up Christian. I want to be today's boiling, hot, red-blooded, full-blooded, Holy Ghost-filled Christian that when a mosquito bites you, he goes away singing, there's power in the blood. Amen. Amen. <laughs> How do you want to be like that? How many of y'all want to be that full of God, that full of the Holy Spirit, that on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ? If we'll get that place and get out religious spirits and get that junk out of our lives, we will find this place full and overflowing. I love it today because not everybody can have their own pew to sit on. Some of you had to sit by somebody else, didn't you? <laughs> and it's going to get better and better. I can't even tell who's here because you're sitting in different places and I like it that way. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! It's just going to get better and better. It's going to. I, I, there's so much I want to tell you, but I can't tell you right now because there's some things. There's so much coming down the road. Oh, there's so much coming down the road. I'm telling you, you better buckle your seatbelt and get to the boiling point. Get to the boiling point. It begins next week with the Freedom of Fullness seminar. Then the following week, Paul Willenbrock's going to be preaching, and he's going to preach a word. I won't be here. Y'all ought to have, there's no telling what's going to happen. 
We're going to be in Baltimore that Sunday. Man, y'all going to let your hair down if you got any, and you're just going to have a good time in the Holy Ghost. Mike, me and you would have trouble with that woman, brother. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. I always heard that, you know, uh, God gave some men hair and the others he gave brains. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Brother Lee, I'm sorry. I forgot you said that. <laughs> And then somebody gave both. <laughs> now, now, now let's not get conceited here. Now, <laughs> we can have fun at church. Fun at church. Amen. Let me get over here and close this this message down. God gave them counsel. He said, "Now this is the counsel of Christ." He said, "Won't you buy of him gold that's been tried with fire?" You know, you got all this money. But, I, you know, why don't you buy some gold that's been tried by the fire? Do you know who is talking about there? Jesus. He's been tried by the fire. He's gold, y'all. Y'all heard the, the, the term, that's money in the bank, or bank it? You hook up with Jesus Christ, and you can bank on it. You can hook up with the gold that's been tried by the fire. Because he died on the old rugged cross. His blood was shed for the remission of sin. He, he is the gold that's been tried by fire. And then we go on and we find here he says, You were naked, uh, but now you can be clothed with the righteousness of God. For our righteousness is his filthy rags. You know what those people at Laodicea look like? They look like the seven sons of Sceva that was naked. When Jesus looked at that church, he didn't see his righteousness. He saw nakedness. What does Jesus see when he looks at Restoration Christian Fellowship? Does he see nakedness? Or does he see righteousness? He said, you were blind. And he told him, he said... Now keep in mind the medical school. He said, put on some eye salve. Some Holy Ghost eye salve. Not something that's been made in Laodicea. But put on some eye salve so that you can see. Because you're blind. See, Jesus was seeing a spiritual condition and they was living in a material position, a physical condition. When Jesus looks down upon us, now, Jesus is concerned about our material wealth. I believe he cares about everything we care about. But I'm telling you, when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't care what you're wearing. He doesn't care if you've got hair on your head or if you don't. Thank the Lord. He doesn't care. He doesn't care if you live in a mansion or if you live in a house on stilts. He doesn't care because he's looking at the soul. He's looking at the spirit. When he looks at Restoration Christian Fellowship, he doesn't look at this building. You and I do. And we say, Lord, we need a new one. And, and, and you know what? He's so gracious, he'll say, I'll give you one. If you'll use it for the right thing, I'll give you one. But when he looks at the church, he doesn't look at the building. He doesn't look at the property. He doesn't look at this worship team and these instruments and these microphones. That's not what he sees. He sees our spirit. Are we naked? Are we blind? Are we poor? Are we lukewarm? Are we hot or are we cold? Well, I think when Jesus looks at us and he looks into our spirit, he sees a people that loves Jesus with all their heart. And he sees a people that's putting their hand to the plow and saying, God, just show me what to do and I'll do it. And you know what? God's going to put some tools in our hands that's going to help you become the person that God wants you to become. God's going to put some tools in our hand and they're going to be put in your hand in the very near future for you to use and be, be the person that God has called you to be. How many of you are willing to get to that boiling point? 
Or you want to get to that boiling point and say, God, use me. There's an old song. Jack Campbell wrote this song many years ago. I'm not going to sing it, but it's an old song. Jack Campbell grew up with my mom, and it's in the hymn books. Jesus, use me. Please don't misuse me, for surely there's a work that I can do. There is. Jesus used me. He will use people who are at the bowling point. But if you're lukewarm, what's he going to do? Vomit. Vomit. Puke. Regurgitate. <laughs> Haven't made you sick yet? I hope we hadn't made Jesus sick. And I don't think we have. I don't think we have. I want you to bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you so much for your love and your mercy. I thank you for what all you've done through these messages of these seven churches. You said, Lord, to the overcomer that we would be able to sit down with him, with you, at your throne. You've made us more than conquerors through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, you said that you stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open, you will come in and sup with him. And I just ask you, Lord, this morning as we knock on heaven's door, as you knock on our door, rather, that we would open that door and allow you to come in. In Jesus' name, with all heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, I want to, I want to say just one more thing. You see, in the custom of, of that ancient day, they had three meals a day. Breakfast was eaten in a hurry, normally just a small portion of something before they would go off to work. They would have lunch. Again, it was always eaten in a hurry, just a small portion. Now around here in the South, we still call it supper. A lot of places they call it dinner. But supper was the evening meal and it was the main meal of the day. And that's when the family would come together and they would sit down and they would spend an hour eating, hour and a half talking about their day. How are you? How did your day go? And they, that would be their main meal and it would be the most food that they would eat all day long. And so, Jesus used that analogy. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, I will come in with him and sup with him. I will sit down with him at the supper table and I will discuss with him his day. But you see, that door only had one doorknob on it. And it was the one that you control. That's why he had to just keep knocking until you opened the door. Now today, Jesus is knocking. He's knocking. And he's knocking. Have you let him in? Have you let him in to have conversation with you? I want to ask you today, 